Member statements. The member for London North Centre. Speaker, hardworking people in London North Centre and all across the province are struggling to find a decent place to live. In late September, I called upon the government to release emergency funds to address the lack of affordable housing in my community. The ministry's response ignored these concerns and discussed employment rather than housing. Too many families are only one paycheck away from homelessness. In fact, the need for social housing has increased by 70 per cent in the last two years alone, with the wait list for affordable housing numbering over 5,000 Londoners in my, in my city. The CCPA estimates you'd need to make anywhere from $16.50 to $27 an hour to rent a two-bedroom apartment in London. This is an impossible standard for many hard-working tenants, let alone Londoners on OW and ODSP. I'm thankful that groups like the London Ho Homeless Coalition, the London Tenants Association and so many other community organizations are standing up and demanding action. There's a real opportunity for the government here, Speaker. Ontario needs bold leadership, not a government sitting on their hands waiting for others to step forward. Londoners know that housing is a human right and it's time they had a government that agrees with them. Do something. Member statements. Member for Oakville. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I uh, would like to speak today on and offer my sincere congratulations to the Oakville Community mm -hmm. Foundation for their 25th anniversary. I attended their Bright Light celebration where they raised funds to support the community classroom program to ensure Oakville students receive a chance to have free local arts, cultural, and heritage experiences. Some of you may not be aware of this, but Oakville has the highest poverty rate in the Halton region. Hence, I strongly appreciate the honourable work engaged by the Oakville Community Foundation. Here, here. Their objective is to ensure that our community has long-term investments to address local issues effectively. They work with numerous agencies, individuals, to, on the best approach to address these issues that result in a significant positive impact. The Oakville Community Foundation is grac graciously funded by more than 200 families and organizations. They designate endowment funds to support specific areas of need, such as youth, the environment, heritage, and others. The Community Foundation has provided more than $40 million in charity grants over 25 years. Some of these organizations include the Kerr Street Mission, Home Sweet Hope Shared Living, Lions Foundation Dog Guides, Halton Children's Aid Foundation, and many more. To all the volunteers, workers, donors, and supporters of the Oakville Community Foundation, Thank you for making Oakville a better place to live. Member for Kitchener Centre. School shouldn't make students anxious, but nickel and diming education is becoming way too stressful for them. Zoe Kiff, a student in my riding, attends Stanley Park Senior Public School. She wrote to me about her concerns that her school will not be able to afford to replace any of the chairs if they happen to break. She's picked up on the financial strain caused by years of liberal and conservative neglect. And as if, this, as if that's not enough, autism cuts are making things worse. Zoe's family has been searching for a program that meets the needs of her brother, Mike, who's on the autism spectrum. Underfunding of public education has left schools struggling to find the resources necessary to support him, so her family's been forced to bear the financial burden of a private education. The conservatives are failing Zoe and her family. Callous cuts have left schools unable to meet students' basic needs. Families and educators are working harder than ever just to get by and are now forced to take on additional fight for students' access to education. I love and appreciate Zoe for speaking out, and she's with us today. But students shouldn't be, fo shouldn't be forced to speak out. They should be focused on their classes, on getting good grades, and making their families proud. We must do better. Our children are watching. <coughs> Member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, can you imagine women are fewer than 20% in most undergraduate computer science programs? That's one in five. Women underrepresentation in the IT sector is an issue that still exists in our society. I like to recognize the Canadian celebration of women in computing, also known as CAN CWIC, which is Canada's premier networking event organized to inspire and encourage female students to participate in computer science. 
founded in 2010 by Professor Wendy Pauli from Queen's University on 8th and 9th of November, the conference held in my writing of Mississauga Malton, and I had the opportunity to join and address the attendees. The conference had over 700 participants, featured 40 plus panel sessions on different issues like imposter syndrome, implicit bias, professional development, and workshop for faculty and high school teachers on inclusive teaching in computer science. Attendees included 438 students, and participation was highly subsidized by many tech, high tech companies and sponsors from the similar field. And the, it was able to do this by the volunteers Professor Pauli, Dr. Inmar Gaivoni, Dr. Amber, Professor Jacqueline Smith, Dr. Kelly, Dr. Sheila, Dr. Joanne, Dr. Kate Larson, and Dr. Kahani. As Milka Duno, a renowned race driver once said, when you put on the helmet, it does not matter if you're a woman or man. Your mission is to compete to win. The important thing is your ability, your intelligence, your determination. Once again, I'd like to thank the Canadian Celebration of Women in Computing for doing such a wonderful thing. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The member for Kiewetanong. Good afternoon, Speaker. I'd like to speak uh, on the changes of the Mining Act under uh, Bill 132. Uh, Bill 132, 130, 132 contains some, some, some changes to the uh, obligations of the mining companies to consult First Nations uh, on closure plans that are required before the, the opening of the mine in Ontario. The consultation requirements for mining closures has shifted to an appropriate consultation within 45 days at the discretion of the Director of Mining Rehabilitation, not even the Minister. This is a troubling, troubling signal to me, but others across the North. If Ontario plans to do business with, uh, on treaty territories in the North, mechanisms for this development cannot be unilaterally imposed. Legislation uh, put forward by Ontario on what they call the Far North cannot undermine treaty and provincial crown obligations to the First Nations. Give, Bill 132 is, uh, is being fast-tracked by this government without giving communities appropriate engagement and time to respond. Every day when I sit here, I hear the economy is booming. Our, all Ontarians matter. Affordability is important. Every Ontarian needs to be in a, needs a safe place to live. What is unsaid is unless you are a First Nations person. Mm -hmm. Government structures will not make changes in our communities, but they can support us. Our people have always known uh, what our nations need. Ontario needs to listen and work with us, not what they are doing now. Miigwech. Member for Lanark, Frontenac, Kingston. Thank you, Speaker. With another school strike looming and parents and students in Ontario need real solutions. Let me lay out some facts for people to consider. In 13 years, Ontario's public education system has declined by over 100,000 students, yet there are 20,000 more teachers and staff. In just 10 years, per pupil spending has increased to over $13,000 per year, an increase of 39%. Wages and benefits now comprise 78% of the education budget. Secondary students receiving special ed support has risen to 27%. Educational scores have declined, Well, Alberta, BC and Quebec have better outcomes. And violence in our schools puts everyone at risk. Speaker, a month ago today, I sent the Minister of Education a letter recommending that this House convene a select committee on education. I shared this recommendation with school boards and unions. Speaker, who knew there were so many crickets in November? Nothing but crickets. Tomorrow, ETFO and OSSTF begin their job action, something that may have been prevented had the minister taken my advice and convened a select committee. Speaker, I have to question, do any of these parties have the best interests of students and education in their hearts? Thank you. Next statement, the member for Haldeman Norfolk. Thank you, Speaker. And, uh, you know, Ontario's first and best Festival of Light, Simcoe Panorama, is set to illuminate the night and the spirit of all who witness its grandeur. Over the past few weeks, workers 
Volunteers have been in full swing wrapping Simcoe's Wellington Park and Christmas magic. It's a sure sign we're about to embark on the holiday season, shopping, visiting with friends and family, and of course for the little ones, means the arrival of uh, Santa. Simcoe's Festival of Lights has been brightening the lives of those near and far for over 60 years. Over those years, things have changed, but the volunteer committee prides itself with balancing progress with tradition. There's now over uh, 60 displays. They fit into uh, three of the original categories, religious, traditional, or fantasy. The majority of the displays are three-dimensional, and they're built by committed volunteers. And for those of us who remember, the displays harken back to the old department store Christmas windows. Mm -hmm. Speaker, there's also horse-drawn trolley rides, a, a Christmas market, and of course, Christmas caroling. This year, the official light up of the park is Saturday, November 30th, this coming Saturday at six o'clock. It's indeed one of the highlights of the year, certainly for me, and definitely for the Christmas season. And I invite all to come and see the sights and sounds of Simcoe Panorama. The festival runs until January the 5th, 5.30 to 11 at night daily. Thank you, Speaker. <laughs> Member statements from Member for Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Speaker. The arts and culture, sorry, the arts and culture are a vital industry for Ontario's economic growth and stability. There's no denying that. But we as a society often take arts and culture for granted, even while we consume it with e almost every breath. The arts are what helps us connect with each other, helps us share messages of hope, of love, of despair, of laughter, even of social concern and a desire to initiate positive change. Through the arts, we foster empathy, we share our histories, we educate each other, we learn about our neighbours and about ourselves. We broaden our perspectives and we do it in a way that brings us together. Arts and culture builds community. Our province is home to so many incredible artists, but it is a struggle to develop and share their skill, talent, and craft with us. Because the work of an artist is usually freelance and carries with it no stability, it's extremely precarious work. Artists, more than most other professions, are often expected to provide their labour for exposure rather than a paycheck, but exposure does not pay the bills. Every audition, every author submission, every demo album is hours of work at their own expense in the hopes of securing just one more paid gig. The pressure is intense, and yet these deeply talented people keep persevering, sharing their art with us, and we are so lucky to be able to experience their craft. Speaker, to gain an appreciation for arts and culture, one just has to imagine our lives without it. So let's promote arts and culture. Let's support our artists. Our lives will be so much richer for it. Here, Thank here. you. Here, here. Member for Cambridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Earlier this month, I was honored to attend the 2019 City of Cambridge Sports Awards ceremony, and I would like to recognize the recipients in the legislature today. Congratulations to Emma Spence, gymnastics, the, with the Tim Turo Athlete of the Year Award. The Cambridge Cubs Major Pee Wee Tier 1 with the George Hill Team of the Year Award. Abby Van Duzer, volleyball and para-alpine with the Heart of Sport Award. The Jacob Hespler Secondary School Senior Football 2018 High School Team of the Year Award. Buddy League Cambridge Adaptive Baseball, the Sports Organization of the Year Award. Ron Goose, Hockey Official, the Don and Benita Rope Sports Contributor of the Year Award. And finally, the Professional Athlete of the Year was taken by Whitney McClintock in water skiing. Cambridge has turned out so many great athletes, Mr. Speaker, and there's one more that I'd like to mention. NHL star Dean Prentice, who was born in Schumacher, Ontario, but spent many years as a pillar in the community of Cambridge. Dean passed away recently, and he will be sorely missed. Dean got his start in the Ontario Hockey Association, playing four seasons with the Guelph Biltmore Mad Hatters. In 1952, he made the leap to the National Hockey League. His career spanned 22 years. He first played for the New York Rangers, then later joined the Boston Bruins, Detroit Red Wings, Pittsburgh Penguins, and Minnesota, Minnesota North Stars. After a career in the NHL, Dean turned his attention to his community. When he returned to Ontario in 1977, he became the Recreation Director for AIR in the Township of North Dumfries. Then in 1988, as missionaries of Forward Church in Cambridge, Dean and his wife June joined Hockey Ministries International Staff Team. Cambridge will be forever grateful for the impact that he and his wife June have had on the community. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Here, here.
Member for Oakville, North Burlington. Speaker, over the last month, I was so pleased to join with several organizations in my community of Oakville, North Burlington, who received seniors community grants from the Ministry of Seniors. These grants help local groups support what matters most, helping seniors remain connected to the community, fighting social isolation, and helping seniors stay healthy. Some of the excellent organizations that received the grants for seniors include the Oakville Chinese Network Society, which was able to bring in a specialist in Chinese arts to teach the Oakville Senior Chinese Painting Society, the South Asian Senior Association of Oakville, which works with the South Asian seniors and held seminars to introduce and promote on awareness on safety and well-being to seniors within the community. St. Luke's Palermo Anglican Church is working with seniors to plan and cook a variety of nutritious and budget-friendly meals in a healthy and safe environment. And the Willow Foundation was able to offer art classes to seniors at the Post Inn in Oakville, giving them a chance to develop artistic skills and connect with others. I've been pleased to join with all four of these groups, and I congratulate them for all the hard work they do on behalf of our wonderful seniors in our community. And I'd also like to thank the Minister of Seniors for this program demonstrating our government's strong commitment to seniors. Thank you. Thank you.